Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. We recently lost legal lion F. Lee Bailey, arguably among the most famous defense attorneys of all time. Successfully representing Dr. Sam Shepard, the real-life inspiration for the fugitive TV series and blockbuster film, The Boston Strangler, Patty Hearst, Sid Vicious, and perhaps most famously, O.J. Simpson and what will forever be known as the trial of the century. The best-selling defense attorney author of his generation with For the Defense and The Defense Never Rests, both of which inspired generations of lawyers to first enter law school. We're proud today to feature Lee's final film television interview at 87 shortly before his death, and we want to share it with you now. Lee, thank you so much again for being part of the show. I grew up like so many millions of kids watching and reading about your legendary courtroom battles both in books on TV and on the silver screen with Harrison Ford and The Fugitive. And a whole new generation of millennials got to know you through FX American Crime Story, The O.J. Simpson Trial, where you were portrayed by Oscar winner Nathan Lane. Long before books were being written about you, let's turn the page back to when you were first being fascinated by books as a young kid. Who were some of the authors that first grabbed your imagination? I think the first time I began to look at authors individually is when I was in prep school. I took poetry courses. I liked uh, William Butler Yeats, E.S. Eliot. Um, I even liked some of the ancients, Chaucer and that crowd. I also liked for narrative fiction, Ambrose Bierce, who people haven't heard a lot of, but he wrote a, uh, a short story called Death at Owl Creek Ridge which is emblematic of the Civil War. And <clears throat> I would say because I was an avid reader that uh, list grew exponentially for the next few years. You've had an extraordinary career from day one, beginning with your enrollment at Harvard University. Did you enroll intending to study law? I went to college to be a white lawyer. That was strictly a fluke and I continued in that endeavor, although not as zestfully as I might have done otherwise, and now have book number 22 going to the printer. After studying at Harvard for a time, you, like so many brave young men of your generation, signed up to enlist in the military, becoming a Marine Corps fighter pilot, and you received your aviation wings in 1954, and first found the law in the service as a squadron legal officer. It sounds like your reading by then had shifted to legal materials. I didn't read many books in the Marine Corps, because although I was a fighter pilot, <clears throat> I was also designated as the legal and investigations officer in the squadron and later a group of squadrons. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to read more in the legal papers. And on the other hand, that was quite an education in and of itself and led me into law school. Is that a position you sought out? Well, actually, it's quite the reverse. Um, I didn't want a groom job because people with groom jobs didn't fly as much. <clears throat> and all the cushy jobs like coffee officer and backgammon officer were taken. And one day the legal officer um, declined to take a flight for some reason. His first assistant took it and the plane blew up on takeoff. The legal officer's wife said, I want you to take those wings off and we're getting out of here. <laughs> I don't ever want to hear that siren go off and wonder if this bell tolls for me. And uh, so they left and they called me in and said, you're not a legal officer. I said, that's nonsense. I, I don't know anything about law. I don't even like lawyers. They said, well, we don't care what you like. Here's a book. Go read it. You'll be in court by me, prosecuted. And so it evolved from there, but that was totally accidental. I could as easily, I suppose, have become a, a high-class butcher. It sounds like when you weren't being a squadron legal officer on the ground, you enjoyed spending the most time you could in the sky flying around as a pilot. Please tell us about that pure passion for flying and when you first discovered it. Yes, so essentially I had flown one time before <clears throat> I was called active duty and put in free flight training where there is no flying whatsoever. But you learn a lot about engines and airframes and navigation and so forth and so on. Um, and in the military, it's not so much a passion for flying, it's staying alive. This is very different aviation than uh, civilian training and airline operation 
commercial flights because the mission is the mission. The mission is not safety. In all the other categories, it is safety. But in this case, you want to destroy the target, and if you have the means to get back, good luck to you. And so that's a different discipline we brought in, and I think it gives rise to less affection for the airplane than you might have if you went out and, and bought it and shot takeoff. You kept flying after the service, and in fact, that played an important role in your high-profile legal career that followed. What kind of advantage did that give you over the competition? It was a means to do business, because I had so many cases so widely spread that there was a point at which nothing but a Learjet could get me to court on time. I preferred flying myself and having a good co-pilot, so something happened to me, the people in the back had half a chance. Bear in mind, as time went on, when I learned to fly, it was fun. As time went on, the computers took over. And today, if I were to apply to London, for instance, um, I would board in Atlanta. Delta would hit the autopilot on liftoff and not touch it again until it was ready to touch down in London, unless the weather were zero zero, and then the autopilot would make the landing, not the pilot. First of all, it enabled me to keep commitments where conflicts had grown that couldn't have been known at the outset of a speech for your group next March. Uh, once you book that, you get very unhappy if I call, you know, Jake, I didn't feel so good today. Um, I used it to gather evidence, certainly, indeed, the bellwether evidence in the whole OJ case was a series of aerial photos that I took of the murder scene from a helicopter that I happened to be flying. And they were very useful in pointing out who was where and when. So I also used it one time to fake out the feds. I knew I was being wiretapped. And they were looking for a million and a half bucks that had been lifted in an armed robbery. So I made noise on the phone like I was going to take a half million or so up to Montreal and wash it. And I flew my airplane to Montreal and I put a little piece of scotch tape across the bottom of the door. And of course, there was no money in the airplane, there was a big box. But when I got back, the tape had been sliced, not broken. I mean, had been broken, so they never discovered it. You graduated top of your class from Boston University in 1960 with the highest grade point average in the history of the law school. And then you become a private investigator where you become very famous for your expertise on lie detectors. I have to imagine that was invaluable experience ahead of taking the bar, being a private investigator. The role of private investigator is the best lead in to becoming a trial lawyer that you can have and I, shove everybody in that direction if they come to work for me. If your investigator is good enough, most any lawyer will do. If you've got the evidence and it's sufficient to bury the opponent, you don't need a lot of gilded language to drive it home. What initially led you to polygraphs as a specialty early on, better known popularly as lie detector tests, in the earliest part of the legendary legal career that followed for you? Because I was the legal officer, I was automatically the investigations officer. I had to supervise to some degree investigation of people that decide whether or not they should be prosecuted. Uh, the polygraph was given in many, many cases to the point where uh, I had to learn a lot about it, techniques, observe many cases, and came to rely on it, which I never lived to regret. In court, they've always been accepted in varying degrees by law enforcement. I, I came into it as a neophyte, and I said, oh my goodness, what a wonderful way to sort out who's lying. Why don't more people use it? And in the military, nobody who ever passed polygraph went to jail on my watch. But when I got out, the district attorneys who were politically derived through the elective process didn't really give a damn if you were guilty or not. Question is, could they get enough headlines to ride out the next election? You were initially brought in as a polygraph expert in the George Edgley case, which puts you on the map as a young star attorney when you were then asked to take over as lead attorney. How did that progression happen? The Edgley case, again, was a fluke. The defense lawyer, who was 72, uh, had word that Edgley 
had been tested by the state police in the past. When someone, the detective, began talking about the tests, the lawyer got brave and said, well, tell us what tests? He said, why detective tests? Well, the coral courtroom uh, became incendiary. Um, he was winning his case, and it was thought with one master stroke, he may have lost it. He probably had a heart attack. They took him to the hospital. And the team leaders that remained began to look around who could help out with a lie detector expert. And they could only find two lawyers. One was in Alabama, and he'd just been appointed judge. And the other was me sitting across the river in Boston. And then they discovered that I was uh, 28 and maybe not seasoned enough for first degree murder, but they had no choice. There wasn't anybody else that knew how to spell polygraph. I went, tried to educate the lawyer who'd fallen ill. And I said he was 72, I was 27 at the time, checked the position. He, he said, we, I couldn't learn this stuff in 10 years. You know, I'd like the back of the head. You go across the table. Well, for a kid just out of law school, who's in his first jury trial, pretty heavy stuff, a capital case, and the defendant sat in the middle of the courtroom in an iron cage uh, with the presumption of innocence all over him, of course. I was pretty ugly to try and put the presumption of innocence in an accused in the same iron cage. How did it feel to get your first acquittal in a murder trial right out of law school? Smart ass answer is a hell of a lot better than getting a conviction. The defendant himself was asked to select who would finish the case. And there were three other lawyers in it, plus the gentleman that was ill, who made it back to the courtroom but didn't participate again. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he said, uh, You did good with that guy. I want you to finish this case. He was an auto mechanic, a lot brighter than they sounded. I did at two in the morning, a jury came in with an acquittal and he stepped out of the cage. It must have felt amazing after fighting against all odds to see freedom emerge like that and so many times again in your career when you advocate so zealously for a client that it actually pays off in an acquittal or a reversal. Yes, it was certainly the better of the two results I could have faced <laughs> had I lost the case. I think I would have had great trouble getting any criminal cases thereafter. People would say, well, what's this punk kid stepping in a first degree murder for? The Dr. Sam Shepard case will no doubt go down in history as one of the most storied and sensational legal battles ever waged in the courtroom. Not once, but three times. First when he lost with another lawyer and was convicted of murder. Then in the appeals court when you successfully argued before the Ohio and then U.S. Supreme Court in a historic ruling. The pretrial publicity could so prejudice a defendant that it could actually prevent him from getting a fair trial, which resulted in Shepard's conviction being overturned and he was let out on bail. How can a man be in jail 10 years and uh, just now be proven innocent or be released from jail? Because our system has some serious flaws in it. So how does freedom feel to you, sir? Ecstatic. Then the third time was even more of a charm when you got a new trial and cleaned the prosecution's clock. That must have felt amazing when Dr. Shepard walked out of court a free man. It's the case that made you the most famous attorney in the country. What initially convinced you that Dr. Shepard's innocence was so solid to make you want to take on his case and cause? I had been sought out by an author who covered the case. He worked for the Chicago Tribune. <clears throat> he was also a lawyer. And he wrote a bestseller called The Shepherd Murder Case. He came to the Polygraph Institute, where by that time, as a result of the first case, they couldn't find any lawyers either to teach legal aspects of polygraphy. And he came over to the school and said, you got a lawyer who works here that might be willing to take on a tough case. And they said, well, we got a lawyer who in our bed is to take on anything. But <laughs> so he said the Shepherd family would like to meet me for the sole purpose of getting a commutation. And I took the book with me and flew to Cleveland. By the time I got to Cleveland, I'd finished the book. It was clear to me beyond any doubt, this guy could not have committed the murder and two, indeed two justices uh, of the Ohio Supreme Court had said 
the state proved him innocent with their own evidence. Well, that was pretty inspiring stuff. When you met Dr. Shepard for the first time in prison and were convinced that he was innocent, what did you say to him at that point to give him any sense of hope about ever getting out of there? So I just said, Sam, one way or another, I'm going to get you out of here. And sure enough, and he didn't believe it. I was far too young to even be sitting there, let alone getting him out of a sentence he'd done for 10 years. Did it ever scare you having to go visit clients in maximum security prisons? I have to imagine that as a criminal defense attorney, that's something you have to steal yourself for if you're going to have a career where you spend a lot of time going in and out of them. No, uh, not at all, because I see being scared of military flight training. They almost killed me twice. You don't have to worry much about cops, lawyers, and judges. Uh, these guys are deadly and they didn't get you. Is it fair to say that made you fearless? Um, that's a fair statement. I don't know. Anything in this world I would be afraid of, even things that go bump in the night. Now, slice that away a degree. You get anxiety, you bet, the reaction, protection, all those things. But I never sit and shudder, supposing Darth Vader comes around the corner. Sure. Who it is, I'll kick his ass. Even after being a fighter pilot, I have to imagine it'd be a little intimidating for any young lawyer to go before the Ohio Supreme Court and then the U.S. Supreme Court in such an effective way as you did when you argued he didn't have due process and ultimately that cost him a fair trial. But it was not limited to that. The further I dug into it, the more I discovered that this case was a travesty. I mean, nobody played by the rules. Uh, certainly the newspapers set out and made no bones about it. They got him convicted. Um, he was never allowed to have anyone investigate the crime scene until the trial was over. That's pretty hard to apply your good investigative techniques to see anything. Jurors talk to each other during deliberations, which is the biggest no-no in the jury system. Usually an automatic mistrial. And there was one other item. To sum it up, Judge Carl Weinman who wrote the definitive opinion on Shepard? The Supreme Court did not. Uh, they dealt with only one aspect, and that is the trial judge's failure to control the press. Jurors talk to each other during deliberations, which is the biggest no no in the jury system. Usually an automatic mistrial. And there was one other item. To sum it up, Judge Carl Weinman, who wrote the definitive opinion, on Shepard, the Supreme Court did not. Uh, they dealt with only one aspect, and that is the trial judge's failure to control the press. <clears throat> Carl Weinman, who was um, a lion of a man, unfortunate to have met him, said um, that <clears throat> this case well, has five independent constitutional violations in it any one of which would justify release. Taken together, they are a travesty of justice. Well, that was pretty strong language coming out of Ohio. And sensitivity in Ohio back in those days, 64, 5, and 6, was still pretty much polarized on Shepard. And uh, you could find a lot of, of opinions both ways. Nothing as bad as OJ. People all say guilty. Uh, but <clears throat> it was an uphill fight. That was on the left hand. On the right hand, I had evidence from the first trial that was perjured off the wall. And I just had fun dancing their witnesses around. <laughs> and the jury had no trouble. When the shepherd didn't kill his wife and probably the next door neighbor did. Do you remember how it felt when word came down from the high court you'd been victorious and that Sam was going to be freed after a decade in prison? It didn't. And I'll tell you why. I learned a long time ago that being impressed with oneself is a short road. For viewers who might only ever see it on TV, what's it really like when you're sitting in court next to a defendant and you have his life and liberty in your hands? Well, first of all, I keep everything in memory. I never take any notes. So that means you had to argue the entire case from memory. Everything is in memory. So, well, it's a lot easier to find sometimes in a notebook that you've misplaced. But <clears throat> uh, I didn't write about Shepard until 19, 
70. Let's talk about that. When did you get your first inkling to write a book? Was that something you had an ambition for once these amazing cases started coming your way? Or did a publisher come to you with the idea in the first place? At the time of the trial, uh, I was working on two books, one by Steve Shepard and one by Sam Shepard. But I wasn't working on or considering my book. Indeed, it wasn't until I went to the publisher of the book on the Boston Strangler uh, that he said to me, my God, you, you got four books in you. Why don't you go by and see Sterling Lord, John, to come see me, and he'll leave me bloody, but you'll get a nice contract. And I did. I bought another new house. The book in question is still considered one of the best-selling and most influential by a legal defense attorney in history. The defense never rests. And you capture so eloquently in that book what it felt like to sit next to Dr. Shepard that second trial out when you made your argument before the jury and they acquitted him. Would you give viewers a sense of what that surreal moment feels like when you know you've helped give a man his life back? Very good about it. For obvious reasons, I would have been, I must say, shattered at any different result because the evidence certainly didn't warrant it. But uh, I knew before the verdict was announced what it would be, as I did in the OJ case. In this case, uh, everything but a wink from the foreman of the jury, who was a 33-year-old engineer, didn't take any guff from anybody. No matter where you were flying throughout your career to argue cases at any place in the country, you were always such a master communicator with the local juries. You knew how to connect with them. What have been some of the keys to the success over the years you've had with that true art form? Sure, jury picking is either an art or a science. Um, some people have better instincts at scoping out a personality, which way it's likely to go in the face of a hurricane or a forest fire or a typhoon or whatever. And uh, that's part and parcel of evaluating the people going in the jury box. But there is no uh, formula. This TV show, Bull, is aptly named because that's what it is. I have never seen anyone who is a real whiz bang at jury picking, or you'd win all the time. I have used uh, jury consultants only because my client insisted on it, and I didn't really notice any difference. Every little reaction. If you are a total observer, that means your eyes and ears, and hopefully during jury picking, your nose and mouth will be inactive, but Eyes and ears are pretty important for singling out two kinds of people. One who shows sympathetic mien toward your client when they're asked to look at him. And number two, uh, the kind of guy you sense will not buckle under easily. In other words, if it's 10 to 2 and he's one of the two, he might say, guys, I know you think you're very smart, but so am I. I'm going to sit here until few more of you come and sit in my side of the room. And uh, we've had cases where a single juror turned 11 of them around. It, it's not an exact science. Indeed, it's probably not a science. Travel with viewers, if you would, back to the writing of The Defense Never Rest. Were there any legal or literary heroes of your own that you referenced in spirit as you were creating what was really, truly a thrilling narrative from page one to the end? I tried to pick up from the various mentors I had hired in the form of literary giants in some cases. Whatever it was that made their prose compelling and persuasive, because after all, that would be my job for the rest of my life. Now, I also did a fair amount, and you don't get much PR for this, a fair amount of appellate work. And although it may seem a little plural, uh, a judge is much more easily persuaded by really good English than he is by junk talk. I wanted it to be a book that would attract the best young law graduates into wanting to be travelers. And hopefully, since I later wrote a book for high school students, uh, to attract people at that level so they could get ready. Because nothing in law school is very helpful in becoming a trial lawyer. Whether you're talking to a jury or writing on the page, is the narrative one and the same, more or less? Yes, because most of the writing I do is dictated. Out of curiosity, maybe using the Sam Shepard case as an example, do you prefer arguing before a jury or, say, before the Supreme Court? I didn't even decide 
exactly what I was going to say until I was at the podium, wow. coming through high gear, looking for overdrive, and trying to find which way these judges' minds were tilting. And that's an exercise because, particularly if you know some of them, it can be misleading. But I thought I could recognize when a light went off in somebody's head after I said, what about this? And so it, it's an enjoyable experience. It is quite a different form of expertise than trying cases. Um, I like them, I guess, equally well. There's much greater uh, intellectual stimulation in arguing with the U.S. Supreme Court, which, by the way, was a delightful experience. This, of course, was I've argued two cases for the Supreme Court, and the other one did not reach a result. They sent it back. But in the Shepard case, I showed up, not knowing any better, with huge placards replicating the front page of the Cleveland paper. And then I had an editorial saying, why isn't he in jail? Why hasn't he been found guilty yet? Really neutral stuff like that. And I held them up for the judges who I thought looked a little impatient with me. But they didn't say anything. I didn't get many questions. Uh, I sat down. The Attorney General of Ohio got up. And apparently he thought he was in some kind of honky-tonk theater. He was in nine justices of the Supreme Court who were seven feet above you. I mean, this is... <laughs> This is not the kind of deal where you feel much like a bully. And he said, Your Honors, this case is just like one from Mr. Bailey's home state many years ago, where a bunch of bleeding hearts tried to pretend the defendants didn't do it. Well, he was, of course, talking about Sacco and Vanzetti, who is in Massachusetts. And Hugo Black leaned down. And he said, Mr. Saxby, are we going to have to decide that case to reach this one? He went out of his sales. He didn't say another thing that made sense for the whole time. I had great fun. Over the years, as you've seen that historic Supreme Court decision that you secured for Dr. Shepard's case reverberate in its impact on all sorts of future cases, especially ones where it became precedent, that must make you really proud. We set a lot of wrongs right with the Shepard case because... Apart from dealing with pretrial publicity, we dealt with bad, shabby conduct by state judges and state criminal convictions uh, that needed to be corrected because the state refused to do it. So as a result of the litigation that ballooned from Shepard, a lot of people got out of the camp. For as many O.J. Simpson and Sam Shepard level cases as you've won over the years, you've also won a lot of victories for the underdog. What's inspired you throughout your career to fight so hard for them in the courts? I don't know. I don't think it's an instinct. I just think it's a fundamental sense of fairness that I acquired when I was young. <clears throat> I was two years younger than my classmates, and yet avid uh, for sports, hockey, football, baseball, and so forth. And I got kicked around a lot simply because of my physical size. So I decided the underdog, underdog ought to have an edge here. It became a visceral uh, form of rooting. Let's turn to another of your most infamous clients, the Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo, who personally requested you be his attorney once he was caught, if I'm not mistaken. What were your first impressions of this guy, and how different a headspace are you in when you're defending someone that you know might be guilty versus innocent, but they have a certain medically unstable condition that might call for psychiatric care, say, versus prison? Aside from a further desire not to be strangled, <laughs> um, Albert always treated me as sir to begin with, and uh, since he didn't have any money, he was kind of on the take. But a case like this is too challenging to turn down if you had to borrow money from your aunt. He intrigued me from this point of view, and I'm always, I guess, looking at the larger, longer range goal. Indeed, I got the judge to sentence him to a mental facility, not a prison. Uh, he screwed that up quickly by escaping, so they put him in prison. Well, most of the inspiration was to win that case, but for the longer view, yes, if 
if the salvo could have been parlayed into a new level of understanding of why these people come out and kill a whole bunch of strangers, random. Certainly society would have benefited. Unfortunately, Massachusetts chose to do absolutely nothing with the best specimen they ever had in their prison. And so he got himself killed a couple of years later. For as many cases as you tried and won, you also wrote that it's important for a good defense attorney to keep his ear to the street for a potential plea bargain if a prosecutor feels their case is weak and they may not win. Does that actually go on in the courtroom while trial's happening, like in Law and Order, or is it different? I'm, I'm not sure a lot of wheeling and dealing is done in the courtroom. The parties usually separate for that, but everybody keeps track of the way the case is going. It's like the stock market. Uh, figure out where you're at, the prosecution always has available some kind of plea and they go out without the possibility of losing the case. The they are, the nicer they'll be. How much has it meant to you since The Defense Never Rest first became an overnight sensation and then one of the best-selling books by a legal defense attorney of all time when future generations of lawyers have come up to you at conferences or courtrooms and said that book inspired them to want to become a lawyer? It does, it's happened literally thousands of times, and I'm always proud that it did. Whether I've attracted a lemon into the fold, or, you know, or you, you, you've got to go through the herd to find out the healthy ones. I was late with a book, and the publisher was beating my ears, and so I had to bring someone else in to help me with the last couple chapters. Um, I, I never fell in love with the book, simply because it was the first child. It was during this 1970s heyday when you became the most famous defense attorney in America that you kept taking on higher and higher profile cases that were more and more challenging to win. U.S. Army Captain Ernest Medina is one example that comes to mind. You successfully defended him from a charge in a court-martial of over a hundred murders of innocent Vietnamese civilians. How was a court-martial different from a traditional courtroom? I was always comfortable with the military. I always felt that courts were more honest than civilian and less politicized. Um, there were suspicions that there was command influence. I didn't have any trouble dealing with that. I go right into the commanding officer's office and say, I'm told that you favor a result of, of conviction here. Is that so? And if he said yes, I said, all right, get rid of the charges because you just disqualified yourself. That happened very, very rarely. By and large, trying military cases was almost joyful compared to trying some of the dregs you might find, let's say, in Brooklyn. What about when you have to come face to face with a sea of cameras, whether you're coming into court in the morning or out of court at the end of the day? That would seem like quite an irritating distraction, especially, say, with a case like Patty Hearst, where you already had so much other negative publicity going on. For those who don't know, Patty Hearst was a media heir who was kidnapped by the Sibonese Liberation Army brainwashed and eventually caught on camera robbing banks with them. Please take us back into the heart of your Patty Hearst defense. What kind of odds, for instance, were you up against heading into trial, given she was on camera robbing a bank with an M16 in her hands? Well, the difference between talking to the press and anyone else is beware. And I said, Bill, what we need to do is get you indicted, put you through trial when you're innocent, then do afterwards what you thought of the whole experience. I bet you're not talking in that tone of voice. Number one is the worst case I ever had. I mean, everywhere you turned, there was no trouble. Patty was accused of blowing up 16 patrol cars with dynamite, a number of police stations, two bank robberies, yeah. and machine gunning into a crowd. She got a total of three years, which is considered a pretty workmanlike job. Yeah. But she should have been acquitted, and if we had gotten acquitted with the Hibernia Bank, the next one would have been tough because the Hibernia Bank happened right after she was kidnapped. The other murder happened, uh, the other bank robbery was 20 months later. Yeah. Well, the defense of brainwashing was unexplored then. All the psychiatrists that were worth a damn substituted under compulsion, including two appointed by the court and uh, a couple 
that I hired. However, when the judge allowed the prosecutor to force her to take the fifth on a murder case that he had already ruled out, otherwise I would not have put her on the witness stand. Well, with that reversal, the worst thing I've ever had a judge do to me in the course of a trial, and sadly in this case it wasn't malicious. The judge was too sick to the bench, and indeed he died right after the verdict came in and never got to sentence her, but it is apparent to me that a law clerk, who was very much aligned with the prosecution, persuaded him to change his mind, said, okay, you can ask her that, because I had relied on that not happening. It should have been grounds for a new trial, but on the other hand, anybody wearing a black robe in San Francisco that does anything for Patty Hearst is going to be suspected of skullduggery. Your second best-selling book for the defense first came out in 1975 at the height of the Patty Hearst trial and was then abridged 20 years later in 1995 with all sorts of new inside details from the O.J. Simpson trial. While Johnny Cochran and Barry Sheck no doubt played pivotal roles in securing O.J.'s acquittal, you had two of the genius legal maneuvers during the trial that really helped turn the case toward an inevitable acquittal. The first being your now legendary cross-examination of Mark Furman, where you caught him in multiple perjury traps and then secured the impeachment tapes to prove it. Why were you so convinced early on that he was a bad actor? Oh, sure. But I was convinced that he planted it not to frame O.J., which many thought. But in order to uh, get himself inextricably intertwined in the case. And as he said on tape on July 14th of 1994 to his girlfriend, they can't get rid of me, baby. This is a case about a glove. And without me, the case goes bye bye. The prosecution was stuck with a letter which had been written to them by a woman who listened to him on at a recruiting station saying what he would do to the end people. And she sent this letter. Marsha Clark, in her wisdom, which I found to be wanting, decided to read the letter the minute she put firm on the stand. So immediately we've got a witness nobody's seen accusing him for no apparent reason other than shock of, of being very, very racial. And that to me was a nice way for them to introduce the lamb so I could pick him up just about the time of the slaughter. Going back to the day you were preparing for that pivotal cross-examination, after so many years of doing it so expertly, was it second nature by then or was it different in some way because the whole world was watching and it was O.J. Simpson and you knew that this particular detective had the key to getting the acquittal? I gave up being nervous a long time ago. I was not nervous when I argued the Edge Lee case for two hours without a note. Um, I just feel comfortable standing and talking to people and choosing the words and trying to interface with their reaction. I see coming from them. And <clears throat> it's a process. Being nervous is like being fearful. It doesn't really get you anything. I don't think it's part of the ingredients of winners. I think unless you've got the balls to stand up to a podium, say what you think, feel the questions they throw, admit when you've made a mistake, and pounce on those who make mistakes in dealing with you. When you do all that with comfort, then you're a public speaker. What about those now infamous, awful Mark Furman tapes where for over 30 hours he has all sorts of racial slurs, he uses the N-word over 150 times. It must have felt really validating to be able to prove that he was pejorious, not only with witnesses that you had, but also with his own words on tape like that. That was such powerful evidence. It wasn't much of a game changer. I already had a dozen witnesses who were prepared to bury this guy. And after the tapes, which Ito did not let in, and then he threw out my witnesses, saying he got the tapes. The witnesses, I said, Judge, I don't got the tapes. Let me have it. Well, it's all right, proceed. But Furman was gone anyway. He was gone before the tapes ever surfaced. Bear in mind, he testified in March. They came up in July. He was gone when I said, if others come to the stand, and say you're lying. They would be lying, wouldn't they? 
And he said, yes, they would. And I said, all of them? Well, this is the first time there's an army out there. So well, the, the jurors told various people afterwards that from that moment on, he, they wouldn't give him the time of day. Another legendary moment that was case turning that you were responsible for during the trial came when you persuaded Chris Darden to have OJ try on the gloves that famously didn't fit when he did it before the jury. That was a hell of a gamble. Do you mind telling us what you said to him to get him to go for it? Oh, uh, not at all. I said, you know, Chris, you're a good shit, but you've got the balls of a stub to a mouse. Bear in mind, there's no record. This is a recess. And I thought I could bait him, and he took it and swallowed it. Immediately, if he hadn't asked OJ to try the glove on, I would have. I could see it sitting on a table. It wouldn't fit your daughter. Well, you'll surely be remembered as one of the true masters of the art of cross-examination. Any tips you wrote about in the defense never rests or for the defense that you'd share here? It's my favorite topic. Very few people like the polygraph, concentrate in it, really get to know a lot about it. And it's a complex um, art, science, hodgepodge, all kinds of things. It is a case where individuals, as with any sports figures, develop their own twists and talents, and they have a big bag of them. So the fact that you were here yesterday to watch this guy cross-examine, that may get you nothing as far as what happens today, simply because he has such a broad art form. When you travel back in time to that iconic day of the verdict, where over 150 million people were watching on their TV screens, you standing on one side of O.J. Simpson, Johnny Cochran on the other, you appeared quite confident and calm while the prosecution was very visibly nervous because the jury had come back so quick. What did you know that they didn't? Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. Superior Court of the State of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the State of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, we, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Ronald Lyle Goldman, a human being. That is the moment of the acquittal. And it was a fact he had been acquitted. I know what the verdict was the night before. I made a calculation from the time that the jurors came back with a question until how long it was before they had a verdict which required uh, 12 people to vote twice each. And the only thing that could have been in that envelope was not guilty in both cases. Now, I went to see OJ at the jail to tell him I thought everything was okay. And the press, particularly somebody from NBC, brought me outside, said, okay, it was I said, none unless he enjoys it, because if you walk out tomorrow, you're going to have egg all over your face. You and the rest of the press have been describing. He couldn't win this case. Oh, it's going to be a conviction and so forth. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't have the experience. And when he gets acquitted tomorrow, I'm going to point at you and do that, just so you can feel the pain. I then went into prison. And OJ had a big wide grin. I said, I'm here to bring you good news, you seem to already have it. How's that? And he said, uh, the guards all want my autographs. They say they'll never see me again. But circumstantial evidence, that often happens when you're on the fence the last moment here. I, I really didn't have any doubt at all. And uh, so it was a relief, yes, but it was more of a relief to look around the courtroom and see the people uh, of whom I did not think a great deal at that point, because they were lousy reporters, uh, <laughs> in awe, as if they had an intended trial, just walked in on the verdict. You recently finished writing for the first time a full account of the O.J. Simpson trial. It's actually coming out shortly. What's the working title? Well, I'm leaning toward timeline. 
because that's what the case was all about. Have you got a piecemeal alibi that will fit into all the areas of the jigsaw that are empty? Um, but the original title, and maybe still a subtitle, is a case about a glove, because that never was anything more than a case about how did the glove get to OJ? If he took it there, he's in big ass trouble. If he didn't take it there, somebody else did, he's not guilty. Some points in the OJ book, I want very much to make the point that those who think he did it uh, are not using their brains very effectively. And write a persuasive account of that as far as my biography. Has it ever frustrated you reading other people write books about you and your cases where they might not have sought you out for an interview and there were glaring inaccuracies in the facts? It's frustrating when people uh, publish what they say are knowledgeable summaries of a trial and they get it wrong. And that means all the people who read what they have to say may have the same wrong-headed idea. Lee, you've acquired so much wisdom in your amazing 70-year career. Any gems that shine brightest as guideposts you'd share here with viewers? I always have the same piece of large wisdom to be prepared. Everything there is to know about the case, don't get surprised. Although research used to mean researching the law books for cases. Uh, that's so automated now. It means searching law books for cases with a computer. Every case is unique in its back pattern. So when I use the word research, I'm talking about investigation. That brings us full circle back to where we began with this amazing conversation. I understand at the tender age of 87, you've been working on your own autobiography. Please tell fans what we can expect to get our hands on that opus. I a persuasive account of that as far as my biography. Hey, I happened. America got stuck with me. Long book. I don't really care what people have to say. My important friends will know I was exactly right. My enemies will know I was dead wrong. I, I dictate to computers. And I do some typing, but I'm a poor two-finger waif and I'm not very good at that. Uh, on the other hand, I don't do a lot of editing or redrafting and so forth. So and I'm able to crank out a fair volume when the notion inspires me. As far as morning, evening and so forth, it's whenever you can grab time. In closing, you must have met people over the years who didn't quite believe as strongly as you did in the innocence of a client you maybe won an acquittal of, but then they read for the defense or the defense never rests, and after explaining why you won those cases, it changed their mind. That must make you feel really good after you believed in that person's innocence all along. When somebody comes up and says, I went to law school because I read your book, and I'm very happy that I did, I think of that to be rewarding. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, I'm very excited about this. For some reason, people think that they can push us around here at late night. Well, believe me, we are tired of being the doormats of network television, and tonight we are striking back. We are going to slap a suit on anyone who even looks cross-eyed at us. <laughs> and to help us out, we have asked one of the real heavy hitters of the American legal profession to advise us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. F. Lee Bailey. Lee, how are you? Lee, as someone who's followed your amazing career of wins for clients famous and unknown with equal passion and conviction, it's been such a career highlight for me personally to have the opportunity to go into such depth with you about your truly extraordinary life here today. You're one of the first authors to sign on for the show, and we so greatly appreciate you taking out time to be on About the Authors TV. Okay, thank you, Jeff.